points and infrastructure that uh, we might be able to improve at low cost and that could help public transport policy in Iceland quite significantly. Uh, and then quick comparison with other Nordic capitals. Um, Iceland is, uh, you know, as you might expect, is the northernmost capital in the world. It is uh, down near the bottom somewhere, but actually not as bad as one might expect compared to Oslo or Stockholm. Okay, so a little bit about this project. Um, the backing for it comes from uh, bikemaps.org, the platform that we use. It, this is a website, and it was created by cyclist researchers in a university in Canada at Vancouver. Um, so it's funded from a lot of different organizations, and it has its own staff and project team. It's not an academic project that has an end period. They aim to do research into cycling worldwide, and they were very excited that people in Iceland could come and use their platform. And they of course, have ongoing uh, upgrades to their website, and we translated the website into Icelandic as part of this project. So you can, um, you can find it there at uh, bikemaps.org, or you can um, follow this link here through Hjólum Pinturis. Um, so they use the data that is submitted in this, in this website, I'll give you an example of it in a minute, to do quantitative research into cycling and then to provide policy recommendations to policymakers in Canada. And it's available as an application and it's got a couple of other functions as well that I'll go into. So here's an example of downtown Vancouver. Here we have um, the number of comments that people have put in different places. This is a single comment. The numbers mean that there are too many comments to display in one place. It's a good thing. You want lots of, uh, lots of numbers, very dense map of different comments. Um, here is the, the map for Reykjavik. And you can see here the Icelandic translation so the red marks here, this is where somebody has had an accident in Reykjavik, and they describe what kind of accident they've had. The green is where somebody thinks that there is a hazard, particularly to them, um, where they might have an accident, or there is something that is particularly uncomfortable about cycling. And the orange is where they have had a near miss, um, and where they think they could have had a, an accident. This is something that's quite hard, apparently, to translate into Icelandic, so we get a really long sentence right here. So we did some, uh, some awareness raising about the project with Cecilia. This is um, in cooperation with Jolim Pinturis. We made these bike seat covers and distributed them around the city and went to different events and got people to submit their comments. Um, out of interest, who here has put a comment on this website? Okay, so still a lot to, uh, a lot to get. So here we have the results for Reykjavik. We have... Um, I think it was about 100, 130 responses, which is pretty good, um, across the whole of the capital area, I should say. Um, just using Reykjavik very broadly in the sense of uh, this presentation, sorry, sorry to all these people who are from Hapnafjörður, Kupavogur, Gardabair, and uh, Seltjörnes. Um, so what, what maybe one of the main interesting things was the main hazard that people had within the city um, was uh, blind corners. This might not be something that you think of first as a hazard for a cyclist, but when we start looking into the data, it becomes really apparent why this is. Uh, here is a typical example of a hazard reported for a blind corner here. Um, and it turned out that most of the blind corners that people reported were on underpasses, going under the motorway system of Reykjavik. And there's a very good reason for this. This is because they're not designed for cyclists at all. This is a typical one, and that's the one that was reported here 
where you have a long downhill section and you have a 90 degree right hand corner at the bottom of a hill where there are people walking through and there's no division of lanes and you can't see anything here. This is quite a scary experience for a cyclist and for the pedestrians that they're walking through here. Um, but it's maybe not something we think of as a, a block to cycling necessarily. So this is maybe one example of where this particular project gives us something new to think about. So there are some easy ways you can take action on something like this. The easiest way I'd argue is just to put up a mirror on a pole here so that people can see who's coming in and who's coming out and then avoid each other. Um, also, another recommendation that you might have for underpasses is to uh, divide things uh, through painted markings. And also, if you can spend a bit more money, sometimes it is good to widen the entrances to underpasses. And this gives you a wider corner to go around and it starts to make it feel a lot more comfortable for cyclists that they don't have to slow down to you know, just a couple kilometers an hour to take the corner. Um, and then, of course, the future work that we do can take into account sight lines and uh, cycling speeds and so on. Uh, here is a, here's another example of uh, an incident, or um, I guess a series of hazards that people reported. And this is on the entrance down to Flemmer, as you probably all recognize. Um, I'm interested, um, I, I sat here and watched people go down here. Um, has anybody here ever cycled down the main road to Flemmer? Okay. And um, did anybody find it a comfortable experience? <laughs> was it in the middle of the night? <laughs> so what you have here is, you, um, as the, the comment reported, is you have these uh, steel barriers here. If you're cycling down the street and a car decides to try and overtake you, then you're at real risk of uh, dying, uh, not least of which because the road actually tips the cars you know, over to one side and causes them to kind of uh, want to head into the, the edge. So I watched many cyclists go past here. None of them were on the road. All of them were on the pavement, and you have this very, very narrow pavement, again, with the, the metal barriers and uh, uh, pedestrians looking very uncomfortable. So here is something that you know, it's very obvious once you start looking at it closely, but it might get missed in uh, city planning. So I was looking at different ways that one could resolve this cheaply and found that it would be very easy to resolve this problem just by directing traffic slightly differently. I know there is a, a reconstruction in progress in Flemmer, and this does not uh, necessarily reflect, reflect that. Um, if one were to take buses, which are in yellow, and route them a slightly different way, so that they avoid the, the main path of cycling. Um, take the vehicle traffic and make it one way, and re again, reroute the vehicles that are coming the other way along other streets which are nearby. The vehicles do not need to pass in both directions along this road. Then suddenly you have a very nice through corridor to one of the main cycle paths in the middle of the city, which is already built on this street here in Kurvaskata. And what we saw was a series of different hazards that people raised going all the way through this junction, because this junction is not designed for cyclists, yet it links one of the main cycleways here and one of the main cycleways here, so cyclists are forced to navigate it. And so there it's very, you know, it's very apparent when you start looking at the map where the bottlenecks are in city infrastructure and where the important parts to join up the infrastructure that already exists is. Here is another one that was commented on several times and this is, uh, maybe indicates a bit, uh, a bit more about this particular joining up effect. So here, this is one of the main cycle roads again. This is at Ethel um, Aur Osa. And you have, in the space of uh, 50 meters or so, four crossings of a road. Um, and this is a, a traffic light crossing. This is a cycle priority crossing. This is a car priority crossing. And then this is a cycle priority crossing. And certainly what the comments were was that uh, cars do not understand the difference in priorities here. Um, I myself have been knocked off my bike on this uh, crossing here, so I have a particular interest in this. Um, but uh, cars don't understand to navigate um, you know, whether they should be giving way to the cyclists or not. And um, overall, it takes quite a lot of time and stress to navigate this whole intersection. Here, here you can see it from the air. The proposal to fix this requiring maybe a little bit more investment, but was just to move the traffic lights back uh, 10 meters. And so suddenly you would have one traffic light crossing and the least traffic on another crossing. You remove two of the cycle uh, car junctions here and it makes life a lot easier for everybody, basically. Um, 
So I hear that the, the designer of the concourse at Lamera is perhaps in the audience here, so uh, I, I <laughs> this is partially for you and I'll tread very carefully in what I say. <laughs> so here we have five comments on the design of Lamer. Uh, not of Lamer, of um, Harpa, I should say. <laughs> um, and again, um, cyclists are using this very much. So I should say for the bike maps, you, where you have a very thick line, this means that lots of cyclists are using it. Where you have a thin line, as here, not very many cyclists are using it. That's probably very obvious. Um, but it makes it very useful to find what the uh, best routes are throughout the city. I know when I moved here, I used to cycle along this road and down here and around the construction site and up here. And then I, when, I saw cycle, um, when I saw bike maps, I realized that there was actually a way to go around the corner here and that everybody used this one and, you know, okay, this is much more comfortable. So it's possible to use it for this as well if you get lost. Um, so here we have a video of this area and I can show you exactly why people were commenting on it. Um, are we going to play? Yep, here we are. Okay, so we did some drone um, photography to try and um, give a better image. So here it's maybe unclear. So first of all, there's no markings about where you should go as a cyclist. And then, uh, okay, maybe it doesn't like me pausing it. There's a, a lack of markings, first of all. And then one is immediately in a place where cars are dropping off their passengers in this ring. And then this is the particular favorite of people who are commenting on it. I think it was the only one where we got multiple accidents reported, is that there is a water ditch here, which is invisible if you're cycling along, and uh, a bridge here, which is uh, difficult to see. And then maybe a lack of, um, of uh, direction about which way to go. And then there was another interesting thing, which is maybe, uh, again, shows the worth of the bicycle maps, is that uh, there was one comment that there is water leaking out of a box here and that it would freeze in the wintertime and create a hazard for cyclists. This is not something that anybody would notice unless somebody reported it in some means, I think, but it's something that could make quite a big difference given the amount of traffic that goes through here. Um, so here are some of the comments that we got about Harpa. Uh, so uh, on this trench, um, a uh, trench in front of Harpa is extremely dangerous as in various conditions it's very hard to see. I ran into this as I was avoiding a group of tourists in front of Harpa, where they do tend to stand and take pictures of the building. <laughs> um, my bike literally went 180 degrees and I fell on outstretched hands, very lucky not to sustain serious injury. Um, and then there's another person who got a flat tire falling in the ditch there and another person reporting it as a, a hazard to them. Um, so. There are some aesthetic fe features of buildings that are very important, and this is, a, like, this is a, a kind of important feature of the way that Harp is designed and built, and it's, it's good for it to be there. And it's possible to maintain the same conditions in front of Harp on the concourse, but just by a small redesign of the way that the traffic is planned there to make it easy for everybody to navigate and to avoid the kind of accidents that people report. Um, so here is one proposal for a redesign, and I guess that it is being redesigned right now as well. Um, so if we were to direct cyclists along uh, one crossing here that was just for them and to take them back around the outside and to make this area pedestrianized so there's no cars dropping off um, the uh, pedestrians in this area, then this would make uh, access, I think, a lot easier for cyclists as well to limit just to one, one bridge to cross here so that there's fewer conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists. But just to uh, mark it in such a way that is... Uh, in keeping with the environment of Harpa might be something that is a, a task best left for the person who designed it, which is why I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and here is another example of something that might not be noticed by city authorities. And indeed, when I went to Reykjavik Borg to discuss this, this was um, something that was quite interesting to the people who are doing cycle design there. This is where there's sometimes um, water filling up underneath the bridge. And this is maybe only noticeable if you commute every day along here. And it's something that could cause quite a problem if you're cycling, is that you know, you're cycling under an underpass and it's suddenly full of water. This is, this is no good, particularly if it freezes. But it's something that people might not notice for five years if nobody reports it. So here, what you have is a good reporting mechanism. 
Um, and the key is to be able to take action on that. Here I thought it was another nice example because you see how people are actually cycling through the city. And so somebody here is uh, noting that there's an uncomfortable bend, 90 degrees. And not only that, you see that people are starting to take their own route. And they are making their, um, do you call us uh, oscillate, or like a, a wish, uh, a, oh, escalate, yeah, a, 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 path, a path that they wish to follow. And here, I think that this is a, a very clear thing for the uh, municipality of Kopovogar. It's a very easy fix just to make this into the official path and move this in just a few meters and make it more comfortable for everybody who's cycling along here. Um, if I have time, I want to talk very briefly about uh, how people approach roundabouts as well, because that was one of the, the other main uh, categories of complaint. And we have it not just on Borgerton, which has seen a redesign to be in favor of cyclists, but also in other places where there are roundabouts. Um, at the moment, we don't have uh, a system where cyclists feel comfortable in roundabouts because the main way that uh, cycle paths go into roundabouts in Reykjavik is to force cyclists to rejoin the traffic and navigate as a car would be. This is actually not so unsafe for cyclists, it turns out, in research, but it is quite uncomfortable and makes people um, feel like they don't want to cycle down this road. So this is something where you might not see on accident figures, but you do see on this kind of data set that it does make people uncomfortable. Um, I want to compare this where uh, cyclists are on a separated cycle lane and then forced to rejoin the traffic with uh, a design in the Netherlands where cyclists can cross the road at, uh, at junctions and go around it. This one works quite well, but what they point out in the Netherlands, and this is where I think that looking at the evidence from abroad is really crucially important, is that how you, how you construct this kind of roundabout is absolutely vitally important. So here are relative accident figures for crossroads and for different styles of cycling roundabouts. So you have the crossroads, this is the baseline, 100%. If you have a roundabout, the accident rate with cyclists is 60% uh, lower. So this is very good. Um, if you have separated cycle lanes, it doesn't actually change anything. So if you were to go and put uh, the roundabouts at Borgerton, if you were to put painted cycle lanes around them, it doesn't change how many accidents you're going to have there. Um, if you take the design that we saw in the previous picture there, um, where cyclists are crossing, and you give the cyclists priority here. So you say to the motorists, you have to look out for cyclists as they navigate this uh, intersection, and the cyclists don't have to stop. Then most of the gains that you have by having a roundabout there are eliminated. The casualty rate only falls 11%. But if you make the cyclists stop and still have this intersection design where they are crossing the traffic but not with the traffic, they have to look out for the traffic, you get a 87% reduction in cycling casualties. And these are, like, these are not small numbers, you know, this is, uh, this is a really major thing for intersection design. But this was only by digging quite deep in a Dutch report that I had found this. And I haven't seen it used in my home country, the United Kingdom, um, or here yet. So I think that maybe some of the reports that we get on bike maps can be used, but it's good to go and look at the international evidence first before we implement anything. Okay, so I'll just briefly finish off with some benefits that are possible if we take action on this data that's been collected. So we get a safer environment, and that's what people really concentrate on when they hear about the Bike Mice project, is you know, we get a, a physically safer environment. But what I think is maybe one of the more revolutionary aspects of it is the is ability to give us a more enjoyable and attractive environment if we take action on the comments, because it is these things that might not result in casualties, like the 90 degree bends and underpasses, or the, the passes through roundabouts that people are reporting. Of course, there's better public health associated with more people cycling because they find it more comfortable and the economic benefits that you all know. Um, but another key benefit of bike maps is this sense of in increased engagement of citizens with their own environment. And that's also a, a very important thing that local government can do well to, to foster amongst its citizens because citizens who are cycling really understand their streets in a way that maybe city planners don't. I have a lot of good ideas that city planners don't. So we can really take a lot from listening to what they say and encouraging them to engage. And as well, this has quite a lot of wider political 
um, impacts as well. If you see something that you have commented on being engaged with by a local government, this increases your trust in government and your connection with politics, and that has a much wider benefit for the rest of society, you know, as being one of the main crises of our times, that people feel out of touch with their government. And I feel if Reykjavik could demonstrate this project, as far as I know, in Canada, the action has not been taken um, based on the evidence. If Reykjavik was to take action on this, then it would be developing a, a, a model for public planning that relying on citizens' input that is, as far as I know, pretty new in the world and could be a good model for other places. So, the plan for taking this on, my funding is now running out, um, so I'm hoping that in the coffee break after here, that there are some people that are maybe interested in taking this forward from local government or from uh, advocacy, or you know, they just want to use this platform. The platform is independent of anything that I've done and is available for anybody to submit on it. So we would need to get more people to submit, though we have quite a good data already, and we would need some work on cleaning, analyzing, and uh, on doing surveying eventually. Um, but what I think is maybe the, the crucial and hard part is to encourage local municipalities to work with local municipalities to respond to the data in a quick way and in a long-term planned way. So when somebody who's driving a car reports a pothole on their street, often it will be easy for them to get somebody to come out and fill the pothole. If a cyclist says, this curb is too high, I can't get across it, I don't know if there's the same kind of response mechanism, but if there is, if it can be tied into the pothole fixing response mechanism, then this is what we could be going for. And then the longer term lessons that we can learn, that is a matter for public planning and policy and longer term reports. And then there is how we might communicate that something has been done about this and has been done because of the engagement with the city with this uh, particular platform. So this might be as simple as just fixing something and then putting a little sign in the ground saying fixed because somebody reported this on bike maps, this kind of thing. Okay, so you can read the report. The full report has a, a lot of other redesigns for intersections and uh, more thorough analysis of the data that I can't give here. You can find it on our website, um, or you can email me for a copy at uh, jamie at resource.is. And that's it for me today. I can take any questions that you have. Yeah.